Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure today to tell you about our uh, recent e exciting work with uh, my Caltech collaborators, uh, Anthony Chan, Rob Rapon, and, and John Preskill, uh, where we study local minima in quantum systems. So the problem of minimizing energy of quantum system is a fundamental problem in many fields, uh, including physics, chemistry, and material science. And uh, this is a problem of uh, finding or characterizing uh, low energy states of a quantum system uh, uh, obtained by finding, minimizing the energy function of the system. Uh, so for, for this problem, uh, many s classical algorithms have already been developed uh, and s often surprisingly perhaps uh, they are very successful. Uh, this includes uh, methods such as quantum Monte Carlo, density functional theory, tensor network, uh, uh, DMRG, and neural network onsets. Uh, and you can also, uh, if you didn't, if you weren't there on Saturday, uh, Garnet Chan gave a very nice uh, tutorial uh, in quantum chemistry where he gave a told us a, told us a lot of uh, success stories where uh, these classical algorithms uh, are uh, uh, very successful in, in finding low energy states of quantum systems. But on the other hand, uh, these methods might appear to also fail uh, badly. So it's a very sort of a, uh, open and important question uh, in the field uh, f for sort of what quantum systems can we f uh, f basically find situations where uh, these classical algorithms actually fail uh, and quantum might actually uh, have an advantage in solving them. But this is a very difficult problem because even when classical methods appear to fail, uh, we, there, we, it's hard to sort of rule out uh, alternative classical methods that might perform better. Uh, for example, if you consider uh, 1D gap quantum system, uh, there's actually a sort of a, a well-known kind of classical algorithm that's able to find low energy states of the, uh, this family of systems uh, very, success, uh, very successfully. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we also know from uh, seminal uh, uh, Hamiltonian complexity theory results uh, from Kutayev and others that in general, finding ground states of, of local Hamiltonians is QMA hard. So even in this, so, so we expect that even quantum computers cannot solve this problem uh, efficiently. Uh, but the hope is that uh, the boundary between what's easy and hard is different classically and quantumly. And the question becomes uh, what sort of, you know, in the, in this, in the middle, uh, what is classically hard and quantumly easy so that we may achieve a, a, a quantum advantage. So the QMA hardness result by uh, Kitayev and others told us that uh, the ground states of quantum systems in general are, are hard to find uh, by quantum computers. And by extension, that also means that nature have a hard time finding them. This also uh, means that uh, 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 nature actually, when it sort of cools the system in, in nature, it doesn't necessarily find ground states or global minima of the energy function, but rather it, it seeks the local minimum of the energy. And this is indeed observed in, in systems such as spin glasses, where we, we see that uh, it's very difficult to actually observe ground states, but rather we see a local minimum in the, in the energy. So this also tells us that perhaps global minima and, and ground states they're so hard to find even by nature, they're perhaps not physically relevant. And what's more relevant are local minima. Motivated by this perspective, we ask the question, uh, how tractable uh, is the problem of finding a local minima of quantum system using classical and quantum computers? Uh, and we address this question by showing that a machine that cools physical system to a local minimum is actually universal for quantum computation. What this uh, means is that if you assume the sort of the standard assumption that quantum computa computation cannot be classically simulated, then finding a local minimum of a quantum system is classically hard and quantumly easy. And this local minimum is uh, uh, a problem, is a sort of a very nice alternative to the ground state problem that offers us a uh, quantum advantage. So uh, I will now delve into more details uh, explaining this result. Uh, I will start by sort of defining more precisely what I mean by a local minimum of a quantum system. So our definition is sort of based on standard definitions in mathematical optimization, and it's given as follows. So we consider the domain of all, uh, all n qubit states uh, given by a density matrix rho. And uh, we also assign an energy to each, each state using, for example, the expectation with respect to the system Hamiltonian. We also need to specify a family of perturbations that allows you to uh, move between quantum states. So this sort of sets the geometry of the landscape. 
And given these three things, we say that uh, quantum state rho is a epsilon approximate local minimum. If any sort of uh, perturbations uh, uh, with, uh, to, uh, apply to that state can only increase the energy up to a small error that scales like epsilon times the strength of the, the, the perturbation. Uh, more visually, what this means is that if you look at a point in this sort of 1D cartoon of an uh, energy landscape, uh, if you see that the neighborhood of states around that point, as long as the, the energy uh, stay above sort of a negative epsilon gradient line, uh, that point is uh, epsilon lo uh, approximate local minimum, minimum. So for example, the left point is uh, epsilon local minimum, but the, the, the right point isn't. And sort of to further build up your intuition, uh, if you consider these five points uh, in this uh, 1D energy landscape, four of them uh, are uh, what we call approximate local minimum under our definition. And this includes point A, which uh, has a non-zero non gradient, but is constrained so that energy can only increase uh, under perturbations, as well as point D, which is a sort of set up uh, atop of a, a sort of a somewhat uh, flat plateau with sufficiently small gradient. So now that we're on the same page of what the local minimum is, uh, I will now define the problem of finding a local minimum. So the problem has four inputs. First, uh, the Hamiltonian H uh, of the system, which we assume uh, is uh, polynomially bounded in energy. And we also need to uh, specify a family of perturbations that sets the energy landscape, as well as uh, a precision parameter epsilon, which we assume is inverse polynomially large. And then we also uh, specify uh, an observable, uh, usually local, that characterizes the local minimum state. Uh, then the problem of finding a local minimum is simply outputting uh, an estimated uh, expectation of the local observable within epsilon error for any of the epsilon approximate local minimum uh, under this perturbation. So importantly, I stress that this is not a decision problem because uh, multiple acceptable output are possible as long as you basically give me expectation in any of these uh, uh, local uh, minimums that, that you see on this landscape, uh, this problem is considered to be soft. Uh, and also, I will stress that this problem uh, is designed so that it has purely classical input and output. So that means that a classical computer can also attempt to tackle it. So as an example, uh, I will sort of uh, uh, consider a case where we consider local minimums of quantum systems under local unitary uh, perturbations. So these are perturbations generated by uh, short time unitary evolution generated uh, with uh, one or two qubit poly observables. Uh, so, so this is, for example, uh, 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 often seen in, uh, in uh, 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 variational quantum algorithms such as uh, adaptive uh, VQE. Uh, so so for these perturbations, uh, we see that uh, it actually has a kind of a problem because uh, for the problem of finding a local minimum under these unitary perturbations becomes so easy that even classical computers can trivially f uh, solve it. And this is because of the fact that if you consider the landscape under these unitary perturbations, uh, we can show that for any local Hamiltonian, no matter what it is, uh, any sort of hard random state is a local minimum for any sort of precision parameter that you reasonably care about. And, and this is sort of the phenomenon that underlies, uh, for example, the, the, the problem of Bering plateau in variational quantum algorithms. And, and this means that you know, in this energy landscape, there's doubly exponentially many such local minima. And, and finding a local minimum by a classical computer uh, is very easy because you can simply output, the, for example, the expectation of the, the observable in, a, in the maximum mixed state. So aside from being classically easy, uh, this, this problem of finding local minimum under local unitary operation, uh, operations uh, is also not really uh, well physically motivated because in nature, it doesn't cool systems by unitary operations, but rather by open system dynamics. So for that reason, and for the rest of my talk, I will focus on uh, these uh, nature-inspired thermal perturbations. So what these thermal perturbations are, they are sort of uh, quantum channels uh, generated by uh, Limbladian superoperators, and these Limbladian superoperators that we uh, that we picked are of the form that's based on a rigorous version of the Davis equation uh, derived by uh, Moskunov and Ladar to describe the open system dynamics when the system is weakly coupled to a memoryless bath. 
So even though in general the system bath interactions can be very complicated, uh, these thermal embodiments can be described by a uh, very few number of parameters. It only needs to be specified, uh, specified by uh, macroscopic thermodynamic qualities of the bath, such as the inverse temperature beta, as well as the characteristic uh, bath time scale tau. And also, you, uh, it's specified by a set of local jump operators th through which the bath interacts with the system. Uh, in general, a local jump operator might uh, increase or uh, decrease energy of the system when it uh, interacts, uh, when the bath interacts uh, uh, th uh, the system through it. Uh, but the temperature of the bath sort of sets the transition rate, which favors cooling operations over heating operations. So we're not going into too much details of this uh, thermal limbladians, uh, uh, because uh, if you want to know more about the technical details, I invite you to go to uh, Anthony's uh, plenary talk on Friday, where he will uh, give you more technical details on these uh, thermal limbladians. So uh, now I will uh, 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 describe a, a new quantum optimization algorithm, which we call quantum thermal gradient descent, which can solve the problem of finding a local minima uh, under thermal perturbations efficiently. So the idea is uh, pretty simple. If you consider any uh, n qubit local Hamiltonian uh, with bounded energy, if you want to find an epsilon local uh, uh, approximate lo uh, minimum under thermal perturbations, uh, you can use the following very simple algorithm. You can initialize uh, the system at any state, and for simplicity, you can take, say, the maximally mixed state. And for each time step t, uh, you estimate the thermal gradient with respect to each jump operator uh, up to some precision. And this can be, for example, calculated using finite difference method or uh, calculating the expectation of the uh, block encoded uh, version of the uh, Limbladian superoperator applied to the Hamiltonian. Then, if you sort of observe that all, if all of the gradients are, are all not very negative, that means that you could terminate the algorithm because you have already found a local minimum. On the other hand, if you see there's a direction where the system can cool, can lower the energy sufficiently, uh, 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 with sufficient strength, then you would then evolve the system uh, with those slim body and, uh, jump operators uh, uh, in the directions where it cools. Uh, and this is sort of a step of this thermal gradient descent. And for this step, we use the Limbladian simulation framework uh, 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 in this uh, paper that's also going to be presented uh, in the plenary talk on Friday as a black box. We're using pretty standard techniques. We can show that this uh, thermal gradient descent provably converges in a number of steps. That's polynomial in the energy bound as well as the precision, par uh, precision parameter. So what this means is that uh, using this algorithm, finding a local minimum of quantum system under thermal perturbations uh, is quantumly easy. Now, I've shown you that it's easy to find a quantum uh, uh, local minimum under thermal perturbations, but is it too? Is, it could also be the fact that it's so easy that a classical computer can find it as well. And for this, we show this uh, nice result, which actually uh, says the, the opposite, where, which is that uh, we show that the, the problem of finding a local minimum uh, under thermal perturbations is actually classically hard. And this follows from the following theorem, which is that we show that for certain two-dimensional Hamiltonians whose ground states include uh, universal quantum computation, uh, has a very nice landscape in the sense that it has no suboptimal local minima uh, for sufficiently large uh, parameters. And what this means is that the, the landscape of this, uh, of this uh, BQP hard Hamiltonian that encodes uh, universal quantum computation has a nice bow shape uh, in the sense that no matter where you start in the, in the space of states, uh, you can flow nicely to the, to the unique local minimum, which is the ground state. And the form of these 2D Hamiltonians uh, is sort of a modified version of the circuit Hamiltonian construction pioneered by Kitaev and others. Uh, essentially, what you do is that you, if you give me any quantum circuit, you can write down a two-dimensional uh, 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 sort of five local Hamiltonian that acts on sort of a square lattice of, of, of qubits, uh, such that the ground state is unique and it's sort of a, a, a weighted superposition over the computational history of the circuit. This means that if you estimate any properties like a local observable uh, in the unique local minimum of this uh, of these uh, uh, 2D quantum systems, you're essentially estimating output, uh, output uh, uh, properties of quantum circuits and assuming that 
uh, quantum circuits cannot be classically simulated, finding any local minimum of the circuit Hamiltonians must be classically hard. So characterizing the energy landscape of these 2D uh, uh, sort of BQP hard Hamiltonians really is the uh, technically most challenging and, and involved part of our work. So for the next few minutes, I will briefly uh, uh, sketch the proof ideas that allow us to, uh, to do this. So first I will sort of go into a bit more details of what this BQP hard Hamiltonian looks like. So if you give me uh, any quantum circuit, I first write it in sort of a standard 1D uh, brickwork layout form. And then I add a bunch of ancilla qubits and swap gates so that I get a sparse 2D circuit. And this 2D circuit has a very an important property that every qubit is acted on by only a constant number of gates. Uh, and this allows us to then write down a circuit Hamiltonian uh, using uh, the, uh, the qubits in the original circuit as well as uh, T extra ancilla qubits that form the clock register so that uh, the Hamiltonian has interactions that also acts locally in two dimensions. Uh, so the form of the Hamiltonian is not very important. It consists of three parts that basically together they ensure that the ground state is unique and is sort of a weighted superposition over the computational history of the circuit. And what I've told you so far is a pretty fairly standard construction uh, using Hamiltonian complexity theory. But the uh, difficult part of our goal is to show that uh, the, this Hamiltonian, uh, the circuit Hamiltonian HC, has no suboptimal local minima. So how do we do this? Well, uh, we proposed uh, a sort of a, a mathematically natural uh, and, and sufficient condition for showing that a Hamiltonian has no suboptimal local minima. And this is what we call the negative gradient condition. And this is the, the operator inequality that relates uh, the, the, uh, the adjoint Blatian acting on the system Hamiltonian to the, uh, the projector onto the ground states of the Hamiltonian. And the reason why this is sufficient is because uh, uh, well, if you look at this uh, operator inequality in the state version, uh, what it's saying is that any excited state must have good gradients uh, in the sense that if you are, have any population that's not in the ground states, you must have a sufficiently negative gradient that decreases the energy. Now the problem uh, of showing this for uh, our circuit Hamiltonian HC seems a little bit daunting it's because we have to prove this for all possible arbitrary superposition of excited states of HC, whereas previous studies of circuit Hamiltonians have mostly focused on, on ground states. So how do we proceed? Well, the key idea uh, that allows us to do this proof is the observation that gradients of excited states is robust under perturbation. So the, uh, for example, if you consider a uh, Hamiltonian H that has a bunch of degenerate eigen subspaces separated by large spectral gaps, if you add a perturbation to it, you obtain H prime, uh, assuming the perturbation is sufficiently weak so that it, it splits the, the degenerate eigen subspaces but don't mix them, uh, you sort of have, you can then apply this property to, to prove the following lemma, which is that if you assume that the excited states of the original Hamiltonian have good gradients, it automatically implies that the, uh, the excited states of the perturbed Hamiltonian uh, that correspond to the original excited states also have good gradients. So this really simplifies our problem because then uh, if you want to show that uh, the, or the excited states of the H prime has good gradients, all you need to do is focus on this uh, much smaller subspace P prime, and you only need to uh, show that uh, the excited states within P prime goes to the ground states within P prime. I will now briefly remark that uh, to prove this lemma, uh, the standard perturbative arguments don't work, uh, because as it turns out, the errors in these thermal imbladians are suppressed not by spectral gaps, uh, which is the minimum difference between energy eigenvalues, but rather by something called uh, the Bohr frequency gap, which is the minimum difference of differences. And, and in general, this can be much smaller, but we are able to modify our circuit Hamiltonian construction to ensure that the Bohr frequency gap remains large. So using this sort of primitive, uh, we are able to show that these BQP hard Hamiltonians uh, has, have good gradients by proceeding uh, uh, in a way that decomposes the circuit Hamiltonian into three, uh, into three steps. Uh, so sequentially, what we do is that we look at uh, different parts of the Hamiltonian and we add uh, the remaining part one by one uh, in, a, in a way that, that sort of exploits the, the hierarchy of energy scales. 
And by first showing that the clock Hamiltonian part, for example, ha has, a, has a good gradient in its excited states, we then what we need to do once we add the perturb perturbation uh, from the other parts, we only need to focus on the, the low-lying states. And we continue to do this until we get to our clock Hamiltonian. And there, we are able to rule out uh, any local minima in the excited states of the final uh, circuit Hamiltonian. So uh, in summary, what I have shown you is that uh, for certain 2D quantum systems, uh, finding a local minimum under thermal perturbations uh, is classically hard and quantumly easy. And this tells us that for this system, there's a quantum advantage in cooling to a local minima. Uh, but for typical systems, classical algorithms are, are, are nonetheless used routinely and often with great success. Then the question becomes, how do we identify more systems beyond this sort of two-dimensional, somewhat contrived version of the system that we came up with, where quantum computers has a, a advantage over classical? Well, here's one potential method. Uh, if you consider you know, your favorite molecule, for example, and state of the art classical algorithms often work by uh, exploring the landscape of a, a classical ansatz of quantum states. And what it does is sort of, you know, it produces a uh, uh, educated guess of uh, low energy states, and you sort of update the parameters of the classical ansatz states, and it reaches sort of a local minimum uh, of, of within this classical energy landscape. However, as we know, uh, this cannot always find uh, a true local minimum because, for example, in the 2D BQB hard Hamiltonians, uh, uh, we have shown that no classical algorithms can find a, a local minimum. So, what you can do is then you can try to evaluate the thermal gradients. Uh, at this classically optimized onset state. And you can do that, for example, by computing the expectation of this uh, adjoining bladian applied to the Hamiltonian observable. And often, this uh, adjoint uh, Limbladian on the Hamiltonian is, uh, is actually a quasi-local observable, which actually could be efficiently evaluated uh, classically on, classic, on, on certain classical onsets. And if you observe uh, a negative gradient uh, at this classically optimized state, that implies that there's a quantum advantage uh, because that means that you know, if you actually consider the full energy landscape where you allow uh, thermal quantum perturbations, you can take a step uh, using, for example, our thermal quantum, uh, quantum thermal gradient descent to, to, pr uh, to produce a state that actually has a strictly lower energy. So this will motivate us to build a quantum computer so we can upload this uh, classically optimized state and then uh, perform quantum gradient descent uh, thermal gradient descent to find a better lower energy state. So I, uh, I, I hope that I have convinced you that the local minimum problem is a natural problem that emerges uh, from quantum thermodynamics and quantum optimization. And it has the very nice property, unlike the ground state problem, it is classically hard and quantumly easy in the worst case. And I will conclude with a few open questions and future directions. As I have already mentioned, I think it's very interesting to identify more systems for quantum advantage by developing, for example, efficient methods to evaluate uh, thermal, uh, thermal gradients at classical uh, onsets. Furthermore, uh, there's many situations, and we, we, and we expect you to, this to be the case, that the energy landscape might actually be bad, and you might have a lot of uh, 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 suboptimal local minima. So in those situations, it will also be interesting to ask uh, if, uh, what, it will, what happens if you, for example, apply not just the thermal gradient descent, but rather sort of a quantum Markov uh, chain Monte Carlo method, uh, and whether or not you can have sufficiently short mixing time to escape from this uh, suboptimal local minima. Furthermore, uh, our classical hardness result relies on having a temperature that scales inverse polynomially with the system size. And it's a very interesting open question whether or not we can achieve this at constant temperature. And this will have a very kind of nice implication that we can use a, a sufficiently cold fridge as a robust quantum computer. And there's also uh, the possibility of considering more general energy functions, including, for example, long linear terms that, for example, constrain your quantum states of interest to a fixed charge sector or uh, having a particularly interesting entanglement properties. And more broadly, I would say that the, the problem of understanding and characterizing energy landscape of general quantum system uh, uh, really points to many interesting directions, not only for finding quantum advantages, but also potentially for understanding many body systems and classifying, for example, quantum, many body, quantum phases of matter. And that's all, and I'm happy to take questions.
Very nice talk. Uh, can I ask a question about the negative gradient condition? Uh, sure. Uh, do you want me to go back to the slide? Oh, yes, or? please. Uh, sorry, one second. A lot of animations. <laughs> uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, this one? Or... Yeah, that one works. Okay. So uh, the right-hand side works, but it's not the most uh, obvious uh, condition, because uh, if you just uh, take a derivative, the right-hand side should be minus r, you want to prove is minus r h times i minus p. Uh, yes, uh, so this is, a, this is a weaker version in right. some sense. So uh, does so that weaker version play a role in the proof later, or uh, just doesn't matter? I think that we probably could have proved a, a stronger version where we included the h, but I think we left it as simply just, you know, we only care about any excited states having uh, uh, at least some uh, non-vanishing, uh, well, not, not exponentially small gradient, and that's sufficient for our purposes. But I think in general, I think uh, having a stronger condition can also be interesting. But we simply just pick the, the simplest thing, the weakest thing that, that's sufficient for proving our, our result of interest. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I was just wondering, um, you know, in your uh, talk, you kind of were talking about quantum Hamiltonians interacting with the bath. Um, is there a, a setting in which you might consider classical Hamiltonians, but sort of quantum interactions with quantum perturbations? Uh, I think that's a great question, and I think that's something that I'm uh, still actively thinking about. I think that uh, if you start with a classical uh, bistring uh, and apply these sort of uh, sort of quantum interactions with the bath, and I think effectively that would reproduces a classical Markov chain sort of dynamics. However, if you start with superpositions, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I think that there might be actually a, a qualitative difference and potentially a, a new sort of quantum optimization algorithm for, for classical problems that might do better than the existing ones. Thanks. One last question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the nice talk. I have a question about uh, your scaling uh, of your algorithm. You consider gradient descent like algorithm, and then if I understand correctly, that scale is one over epsilon square. Yes. To find local minimum, right? Yes. So if I understand correctly, for real function to find a local minimum, then like gradient descent like algorithm requires one over epsilon cube or fourth or for convex function, SGD find a local mi minimum, global minimum for convex function, then I see. real function. It's uh, one over epsilon square, this is okay, but uh, for real function, non convex, it works as one over epsilon cube or something like this, if I'm not correctly. So, how do you avoid this kind of counter examples? Uh, so I'm not super familiar with this epsilon cube and, and, uh, yes, no. and fourth scaling that you mentioned. Uh, I I think um, maybe one possibility is that we're only counting the number of gradient steps. We're not counting the complexity in estimating the gradients. So that might play a role. Uh, and, and I think that uh, sort of this epsilon square scaling actually is also not optimal. We could improve it, uh, which I guess actually is opposite of what, you, what you're saying. Yeah. But, but I think uh, you really follow sort of relatively standard from, uh, from just Taylor's theorem and also a bound on the second derivative. So maybe, maybe, maybe because we have a sharper bound on, on the second derivatives, uh, that might allow us to get a better scaling. That, that could be another reason why for this uh, discrepancy. Okay, I need to take a look at proof. Thank you for answering. Lee, you want to yeah, you talk about uh, the optimization over uh, thermal perturbation. How about the other perturbation, or you just don't restrict that you just do optimization over all state space? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and indeed, I think that's definitely a very interesting future direction. Uh, the nice thing is that you know adding additional form of perturbations can only remove local minima. So what we have shown still holds, but I think that you know, for example, it's interesting to consider unitary uh, perturbations with say uh, mistaken measurements and, and, and sort of maybe a addition of fresh ancillas. Uh, that could be also another possibly uh, sort of more algorithmically motivated uh, family of perturbations. But I think in general, yeah, characterizing landscape under various type of perturbation is a very interesting uh, direction that we hope to maybe study more. Okay, thank you. All right, this concludes the session. Please let's thank the speaker and all other speakers.